Saruti. I'm Hannah. And welcome to Red Handed. If you have not got your live show tickets for the 27th of May at Islington Assembly Hall, we think we're going up at 7.30, that sounds about right. You have to, otherwise there will be great shame upon your ancestors, great shame upon you, mm-hmm. shame upon your cow, mm-hmm. dishonour. Absolutely, dishonour everywhere. We know that the website is a little bit confusing, but please don't go looking for it. Just follow the link that is in the episode description for this episode and also all over our social media. Yes, yes. Follow the social medias. Mm-hmm. Don't listen to anyone except us is basically the message. <laughs> yeah. That, that is the manifesto of the cult we shall eventually yeah, the begin. The beginning, middle and end. <laughs> but no cult formation today. Well, no. Abs- well, well not from us. Not from us, not no. Not from us, no, but no. from other people. Yes, because... from a fair few. Welcome, listeners, to the second and final part. I, I feel like that's very grandiose, isn't it? <laughs> to the second and final, <laughs> just a two-part series on the evolution of the Satanic Panic series that we at Red Handed have lovingly crafted for your delightful ears. Last week, if you listened to part one of this series, which you should definitely do because this will make more sense, we explored the origins of the Satanic Panic in the 70s and 80s with the rise of the possessed and murderous mosh-pitting teenager. In this episode, we're going to bring you bang up to date with a look at how the naughties are not much different. Yes, as we breadcrumbed you all week last week, in this episode we are stepping out of the grainy pasto times into the terrifying 4K Ultra HD world of today to discover how QAnon and conspiracy theories about a satanic cabal of paedophilic deep state officials running the world are just repackagings of the 70s satanic panic, but how they are still gaining traction and horrifyingly leading to real world violence and murder, like the murders committed by Matthew Taylor Coleman a man who killed two of his own children because they had, quote, the serpent's DNA. There's a lot to unpack this week, so to make sure all this makes the most sense possible, let's start at the beginning. And the most sense possible is still absolutely none. (laughs) I think we, you know, you've done a very good job of pulling the story together, but it is so confusing. I feel like everyone knows the words QAnon, Mm -hmm. but nobody knows what it actually is. I think it's like that summary I just gave of like, satanic cabal of paedophilic cannibals is probably what most people will associate with QAnon, if you know anything about it at all. But yes, I have spent the last two weeks sort of hovering around an abyss on the internet that leads nowhere good. And my brain is quite frazzled. And in the next hour and a half, I am very much looking forward to leaving this all behind me. (laughs) So... Some of you might not know that QAnon started with a singular Q. On the 28th of October 2017, an anonymous user named just the letter Q posted an odd message on the politically incorrect forum of 4chan. And this message read, HRC, extradition already in motion, effective yesterday with several countries in case of cross-border run. Passport approved to be flagged effective, 10 slash 30 at... 12.01 12.01 a.m. Expect massive riots organised in defiance and others fleeing the U.S. to occur. USMs will conduct the operation while NG activated. Proof check, colon. Locate an NG member and ask if activated for duty 10 30 across most major cities. I am sorry that I made you read that out. <laughs> it is so bizarre doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And if you're looking to us to solve that problem for you, I'm afraid we can't. But the glossary that might help a little bit is this. USMs means US Marshals. NG stands for National Guard. And HRC stands for Hillary Rodham Clinton. Oh, yes. There'll be a lot of her popping up in today's episode. So a few hours after this cryptic post, Q posted again this time talking about Russia, the US's three-letter agencies. And that's what they call it all the time. Presumably they're talking about like the FBI, the CIA, maybe the NSA. Mm. And of course, about George Soros. Q signed this message off Mockingbird 10-30-17. So that's the 30th of October 2017. And God bless fellow patriots. Oh, yeah. It's a buzzword. It's a dog whistle. (laughs) So this post set those already neck deep in the world of conspiracy theories into absolute overdrive. 
So many of you listening might not know what Operation Mockingbird is. I didn't know this until I was doing the research for this episode. So when Q signs off Mockingbird, it actually is in reference to Operation Mockingbird, which, as far as conspiracy theories go, is absolutely fucking real. It's a conspiracy rather it's a, than a conspiracy it's a, theory. It's a, yeah. it's a real thing. Yeah. It's a real thing that happened. Let me tell you what it is. During the Cold War, the CIA launched Top Secret Operation Mockingbird, which involved bribing journalists and institutions around the world in order to control public opinion by manipulating news media. So basically, state propaganda. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on in the Cold War. Yeah. But it carried on for quite a lot longer than that. So don't believe the media. Anything. Don't believe anything. Don't believe anything. Except us. (laughs) And this story was broken by investigative journalist Carl Bernstein, who unveiled this scandal in the 70s and wrote that according to the plan, the CIA had put 400 journalists on the payroll and had them write fake stories on whatever they wanted, using the message that they wanted to get across on that particular issue. So, of course, these posts by Q began attracting intense online attention. Why? Many reasons. Firstly, Q claimed to be a high-level government informant, with top-level security clearance, which is known as Q-level clearance. Another reason is that all of Q's posts, known as Q-drops, are incredibly vague and cryptic, which of course is deliberate because it means that just like horoscopes, it allowed people to interpret the post's meaning however they wanted. To avid followers, Q-drops were like clues, breadcrumbs, to build your own conspiracy adventure. And they loved it. The conspiracy theories and the fast-growing group of people who believe Q's postings both became known as QAnon. And you can see why it became so addictive for people. When you scroll through the posts as a civvy, you would be forgiven for feeling your eyes glaze over and possibly turn to stone. But when you consider posts like on the 8th of March 2018, quote, everything has meaning, this is not a game, learn to play the game, Q. I think for many, this was a combination of mass hysteria and LARPing. That's like the most 1984 shit of like, what is it, like ignorance is knowledge, like, you know, Mm -hmm. freedom is slavery, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just very like, I get it. It's very addictive. That's the whole appeal of QAnon is that they're not just sat there telling you in very obvious statements what's going to happen, etc. They are, whoever they are, uh, sort of hiding it in these Mm -hmm. cryptic messages that people feel like it's a game. But at the same time, it's not a game because it's really fucking serious. But it is a game because you sit at home and you get to play like detective, you know, you get to play conspiracy theory detective. And I think that joining dots that are being put out for you by Q, that euphoric rush that must happen when you feel the pieces align in your own head must be very addictive. Oh, totally. As humans, we love cryptic messages. Mm-hmm. The Bible's fucking full of them. And we love looking for messages. We love looking for patterns. And this person, Q, is claiming to be this high-level informant, claiming to sort of be a whistleblower. Mm-hmm. They would do things like post pictures that they would claim would be inside, like Air Force One, showing that they were really high-level. Again, none of this is verified. There are loads of theories about who Q is. We're not going to go into that because it's so much. Mm-hmm. It's so much. But there were even people, you know, saying that maybe it was like Steve Bannon or somebody like that. Mm. We just don't know who it was. I think it was Hillary. (laughs) Hillary, double bluff. Wow, the greatest false flag (laughs) operation of all time. I wouldn't put it past her. So these Q-drops, they were so popular that they racked up. And by 2020, there were almost 5,000 posts. Although QAnon had started on 4chan, it ended up moving to 8chan. And if you don't know what 8chan is, it's the even more bizarre corner of the internet that, unlike the already very weird 4chan, had absolutely no moderators whatsoever. Mm -hmm. No rules, nothing. You could do anything. You could talk about anything. And maybe in theory that sounds like a good idea, but it soon, inevitably, became a hotbed of child abuse images. And it was actually taken offline in August 2019. And that's a very clear example of why we can't have nice things. Yes. But it didn't really matter that 8chan was taken down in 2019 because by this point, QAnon had already crept its way wider into the interwebs and firmly established its after 8chan life on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook and Instagram, with posts and videos now banking millions of views every single day. Then suddenly, on the 8th of December 2020, Q 
Q mysteriously vanished after having spent months predicting a big Trump win. But even though Q seems to have gone for good now, like no one's heard from them since 2020, Q in on the movement continues to grow. This episode of Red Handed is sponsored by Bloom Nutrition. Do you identify as a hot girl with stomach issues? Well, me too. If you're dealing with bloating, digestion issues, or just don't know why you're not feeling so good lately, Bloom can help you feel hot all year round, like you are without the stomach issues. Bloom Nutrition makes it easy and delicious to give your body what it needs to feel your best, inside and out. Their greens and superfood power blend fights bloating, helps digestion, increases natural energy and keeps your skin glowing. Bloom greens are packed with over 50 nutrients, including whole fruits and veggies, fiber, probiotics, antioxidants and many, many more. All in one easy to drink formula. All you've got to do is mix it in with water or into your smoothie to add to your daily routine. It comes in four delicious flavors, coconut, mixed berry, citrus and original. Bloom is made for you, whether you're trying to recover from a big meal or a night out, or if you're a fitness person. Over 350,000 people trust Bloom to feel better every day. And right now, Bloom Nutrition is offering our listeners 15% off purchase of their greens and superfood blend. When you go to bloomnu.com slash redhanded. That's B-L-O-O-M-N-U dot com slash redhanded for 15% off your purchase. One more time, bloomnu.com slash redhanded for 15 whole percents off. So what exactly are we dealing with here? What are the conspiracy theories of QAnon? Well, there are lots of them, but QAnon is now an all-encompassing conspiracy theory, one with dozens of offshoots and side plots. And these side plots really picked up during the pandemic. Unsurprisingly, not many people had a lot to do. And we know that it picked up because Google searches for QAnon went up tenfold in the first three months of lockdown in the West. The conspiratorial documentary Plandemic and theories that the vaccine is actually a ruse for the government to insert a microchip into your arm have also been popular among QAnon fans. I feel like if you're a QAnon person, it's very like in for a penny, in for a pound. It is, and I think it's also... We'll go on to talk about this, but, you know, things like a microchip being implanted into your hand or your arm, sorry, through the vaccine... Obviously, it's very easy to laugh at that kind of thinking because it feels very much like what you would historically have said as like tinfoil hat thinking, like people hiding in a room thinking that the government's spying on them using satellites and stuff like that. But the government does do shit like that. Yeah. And also it's like typically the people that were believing in this were the people who were losing their jobs and having a really fucked up time during the pandemic. They felt like this is all just a ruse to control us. And I'm not here to say that that's like a great way to think or a healthy way to think. But I am here to say I understand how people got to that point. Yes, I think... Not great, but I get it. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It's incredibly... I think my default position on especially the chip in the arm theory, I'm like, why do you think you're that important? Because that's going to cost a fuckload of money. Yeah, yeah. And there are easier ways to control people. And what is surprise, it? Surprise, surprise. Like think they the economy. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, you know, I, that's my default. But I do think I have to hold myself to account a little bit more on it because like it's very easy to just scoff at it. But like there are a lot of people who really think that and it's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. So laughing at it, just like laughing at incels, is kind of not really the right thing to do. I think that is basically the foundation of this entire episode. We're going to go into the whole QAnon, like depth and breadth of these conspiracy theories as much as we can. And also obviously talk about the horrendous real life violence and murders that have been associated with this. But I think the key at the heart of all of this is the point that we need to try and get to is understanding why people feel this way so that we can in somehow reach out to them. Laughing at people who believe this way or who are living on the fringes of society thinking these things is only going to create further division absolutely, and yeah. polarization. And that gets us absolutely nowhere. So if your question is, what do we do about this? Well, the answer is, what do you want to get out of it? So there are lots and lots and lots of conspiracy theories that are all sort of rolled into one big QAnon bundle. But there are three main ones that we could pick out. And they are, number one, satanic paedophiles run the world. Number two, Trump is saving us from these satanic paedophiles. And then number three, the storm. Let's kick off with satanic paedophiles, our home turf. We've been here many times before. I really enjoyed writing that sentence. Yeah, it's just a good statement to say. I mean, it's a terrible statement to say, but you know, you know some, sometimes it's just fun. 
And fans of QAnon like it as well, because the idea is that a cabal of satanic paedophiles is secretly torturing, harvesting and murdering children. And that's a pretty core belief of QAnon. Yeah, you can sort of, like I said, it is very much a choose your own conspiracy theory adventure with QAnon because it is so vague. It's so cryptic. It's also so all encompassing, like you said. And it's also very importantly, open source. It's like Slenderman, right? That started off because one photography competition and then it sort of spiraled into something that gained a life of its own on the internet with people adding to it, like fan fiction. This is very much an open source conspiracy theory. Yeah. And it is one that lives on the internet. So it is constantly being added to. So you can, as a potential QAnoner, pick and choose what you want to believe or what you want to focus on. But really the satanic cabal of pedophiles is a non-negotiable. It is at the core of everything. And these satanic pedophiles at the core of everything are also deep staters and they traffic innocent children because they want to drink their blood, sexually abuse them, cannibalize them, and also they kidnap these children so that celebrities can extract from the pituitary glands of these children a chemical called adrenochrome, which, according to the gospel, according to QAnon, adrenochrome is a substance that allows celebrities to stay looking young. And again, I'm sure that this sounds very amusing. It does. I laughed. I laughed while I was reading this. Of course oh, it does. Oh, how we laughed. Oh, how we laughed. It's just nonstop laughter in the office when we're reading about adrenochromes. But it is real. These people genuinely believe that this is real. They're not, I know we called it LARPing, but they think it's real. Yeah. And that is terrifying, but also why it's not really a laughing matter. Uh-huh. So adrenochrome is in fact actually a real substance. It's produced by the oxidization of adrenaline, but it doesn't really seem to do anything or be associated with anything specific. Rather, this theory of adrenochrome harvesting, which actually did exist long before QAnon, just gained popularity through this recent internet phenomenon. Apparently, adrenochrome, as an elixir of youth, actually came from the 1971 book Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas by Hunter S. Thompson who actually made up the effects of this chemical. Hunter S. Thompson <laughs> uh -huh. is, uh, I wouldn't go to him for scientific advice. No. Unless but... it's how to do as many drugs as humanly possible without dying. Uh -huh. Inching toward death. That's the only advice I would go to Hunter S. Thompson yes. for, I think. Yes. And in fairness to Hunter S. Thompson, he never intended. Oh, no, 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 no. He actually admitted when the movie was made to the director, I completely made all this because I'm an author. I'm a fictional author. But somebody has taken that theory, run with the adrenochrome story. And now there is even a very specific conspiracy theory that sits within the QAnon sphere about adrenochrome and Hillary Clinton called Frazzle Drip. Frazzle Drip claims that there is a video showing Hillary Clinton and her former aide, Huma Abdin, ripping off a child's face and wearing it as a mask before drinking the child's blood in a satanic ritual sacrifice in order to obtain adrenochrome. This is going to sound unfeminist of me. Are you going to say that if I was ripping off the face of a child to get adrenochrome, I'd want to look better than Hillary Clinton does? Yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. She doesn't look that young. No. You know, like, it's, she's not, um, she's not walking more. around like fucking Sofia Vergara up in exactly. here, you know? If I had to make a deal with the devil and tear children's faces off, I'd want to look better than that. Yeah. I That's mean, she fine. looks fucking great for her age, but she, she, looks, does, she, she doesn't... She fine. Yeah. She's just it. I mean, we'll go on to see why Hillary is such a central figure, but it's all, it's all stuff we've seen before. Yeah. But also, she doesn't fucking help herself whatsoever. <laughs> just like, just leave it, Hillary. You lost. Stop crying on the news and talking about it still. Please give up. Of course, if you have listened to last week's episode, all of this satanic paedophile stuff is probably ringing quite a few bells and sounding very familiar indeed. Because accusations of paedophilia, thrown around at anyone and everyone in power, is the ultimate stain on your reputation, isn't it? It's the worst thing that people can think of. Yeah, I feel like when they're sat around thinking like, what can we say? What can I call this person? I know, I'll call them a paedophile. Call them a paedophile, but make it demonic. <laughs> exactly. Because, you know... We may sit on the left, the right, the centre, but I think almost everyone agrees that mm -hmm. child sexual abuse is very wrong. Yes, in a very polarised world, it's one of the few things that all of us can agree on. So if QAnon 
claims to be all about saving these kiddies from satanic ritual abuse, and you're talking shit about them, well then you must love murdering children too! Yeah, they've put themselves into this kind of weird dichotomy, right? Yeah, Where it's yeah. like, either you're with us or you're against us. And if you're against us, you don't care about kids getting raped and murdered and harvested. And of course, we don't help ourselves. The world doesn't help itself either when real life rich as fuck sex predators like Jeffrey Epstein keep Epsteining and his twisted web of perverts, including the likes of sweaty nonce Prince Andrew and Bill Clinton, just keep feeding the story. Nothing happens to those people. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying is like, we can laugh at these QAnoners, but when you see things like Jeffrey Epstein, Prince Andrew, etc., nothing happens. Nothing yeah. is going to happen. And, I, and that was true. Like, mm -hmm. they really were trafficking children to have sex with the ultra-rich. Like, that happened. So when you're a QAnoner, like, to be honest, it's not that big of a leap. If I were a QAnoner, I would feel frustrated Absolutely. by being like, but so you believe Epstein mm -hmm. happened, but you don't believe exactly. the next step. Exactly. That's why it's very easy to look at people who aren't QAnoners and be like, you're all in on it. You're saying, fine, Jeffrey Epstein happened because it all got exposed, but there's nothing else. There's nothing else going on. And it's like, I get why they feel frustrated. Yeah. And I also understand how easy it would be to want to do something about that. If you, You'd want to tear those people down if you truly, really believed in your heart of hearts that the people running the world were eating children uh -huh. after raping them. If yeah. you truly believed that, uh -huh. then of course you would want to do something about it. You'd want to be part of a movement of people who aren't being lied to anymore. That sounds appealing. You're a crusader. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing to remember. If you really genuinely believed that this was happening, imagine how angry you'd be. Mm -hmm. Because that's what's going yeah, on. Yeah, of course. Like, if I truly believed that Barack Obama was eating children, mm -hmm. if I truly believed that, I would take some action. Absolutely. So now let's come back to point two, which was, of course, that Trump is the prince that was promised. When Trump was elected in, he offered hope to a lot of people. He was calling out the elites. He was saying that he was going to drain the swamp and he was going to focus on real working people. Now, obviously... He did none of those things. <laughs> Trump didn't really care about these people. And it turned out that he was absolutely part of the swampy problem. But this cleansing of the elites, the addressing of inequality and injustice, this is what people wanted and needed to hear. I think, you know, with the whole Trump phenomenon, the Trump years, obviously when it first happened, it was very easy to listen to the horrible things he was saying that like hit our ears very hard as people who are not politically aligned with him in many ways and be like, oh, anybody voting for him is a horrible piece of shit. And I think if now, all these years later, you're still thinking that, I think you've missed the point. Yes. Because obviously people who are racist, misogynistic, awful people probably did vote for Trump. But if you're thinking that everybody who voted for Trump is a horrible, nasty bigot, mm -hmm. then you have misunderstood the issue and you have misunderstood how and why Trump won. He won because he was appealing to the people who had been left behind, who had been forgotten, who had been ignored by the political classes for generations. People who were, you know, who had seen every factory and coal mine in their town closed down and who were living in yeah, drinking abject poison poverty. water and flint. Like. Exactly. They were people who were tricked by a con man who told them everything they wanted to hear. But if you pay attention to the things that he said to them, we should understand how left behind those people are. Yeah. I mean, it's like anything. It's like nothing happens for no reason. Exactly. That's why. And again, you know, if you even want to look at it like quantitatively, there were people who voted for Barack Obama twice and then voted for Trump. Yeah. You know, it's not all just aligned with people who were like, well, I don't want a fucking non-white president. I want Trump. Like, you know, you've got to look at the bigger picture. So when Trump failed to materialize many of the promises he had made on the campaign trail, QAnon offered a sort of relief from the reality of the situation. Because here are a bunch of people who put their faith in Trump, misguidedly, of course, but you understand maybe why they wanted to believe him. And so when he didn't do what he said he was going to do, QAnon was there sort of like as a little emotional safety net. Trump didn't throw masses of his evil political opponents in prison, and he didn't expose the global satanic paedophilic cabal. Because remember, when we say that Trump was the prince that was promised his point two of QAnon, it is a really core cool belief that Trump was the one who was going to come and expose all of this stuff, all of the deep state, the satanic cabal, and he was going to throw all these elites in prison. He was going to be 
the bringer of the second coming, almost. And obviously that didn't happen. So QAnon kept telling them, don't worry, everything's fine, Trump is in control, and he'll be making his move very soon. Q even started posting things to explain why Trump's government was seemed so out of control mm-hmm. by saying things like it's a cover. Oh, it's, it's a, a ruse. cover. It's a ruse. A the incompetence yeah. is a is a double bluff, exactly. So that the satanic pedophiles don't like catch on. Oh, they don't know that they're onto them. Yeah, yeah. So it was like kind of once again a logical black hole where it doesn't matter what you're saying mm-hmm. because you can sort of mentally gymnastic your way out of it. And with Trump also sort of dropping little breadcrumbs, like on the 6th of October 2017, when he said at a dinner party with military leaders that, quote, it was the calm before the storm. Well, the QAnon lot almost pissed themselves with excitement. And that brings us, very neatly, on to point three, the storm. And if you have even a cursory interest in QAnon, you will have heard about the storm. But what is it? If you think it's a metaphor, you are wrong. It's a biblical Noah's Ark-style storm that will come along and kill all of the evil satanic paedophile elites while leaving the normal people with armbands on, I assume, and, like, life vests. Literally. Right. Literally. That is what they think. What do Americans call armbands? Floaties. (laughs) Floaties. No. Water wings. That's another thing they say. So who could really believe that that is happening? Real-life human people, that's who, and quite a lot of them at that. There was a poll carried out last year by the Public Religion Research Institute and they found that 15% of Americans say that they think, quote, that the levers of power are controlled by a cabal of Satan-worshipping paedophiles and that American patriots may have to resort to violence to bring these paedophiles down. 15%. That's millions. It's a country of... 300 million people. And it only gets worse, I'm afraid, because in the same poll, 20% of those who were asked also said that they believed in the literal storm that is a coming. So not only the 15% that believe in the satanic paedophiles, 20% of people believe in this storm to wipe out the elites. Which, to be honest, weather be crazy at the moment. Like an earthquake just next to Japan. Like, I, again, I can see mm-hmm. why they would be like, You see, it's coming. Of course, look at all of these natural disasters. Mm -hmm. And uh, this this is perfect. They also found that a whole one third of Americans, that is one in every three Americans you could meet, at some point has believed at least one QAnon conspiracy. I know it's very all encompassing, so it does like stretch quite far and wide. And like, does that include things like Operation Mockingbird, which are very real? I don't know. You can prove anything with statistics, but that's still quite a lot of people. And the research team concluded that the population of the country who believe in QAnon's core beliefs are probably more than 30 million. Help. But that's what they need. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Help them. Mm. And they also found that unbelievably, this is basically comparable in size to the entire population of white evangelical Protestants in the US. So essentially, the size of QAnon in the US now matches that of a major religious group. Good. We thought we had problems with Scientology. Yeah. I mean, I think just like putting that into perspective, think how much power white evangelical Protestants as like a voting bloc, as like a lobbying group have in the US. Now you're saying that there is a group that is as large and is growing. I would say QAnon is arguably... Not argue, I, I absolutely would say it's growing faster than white evangelical Christianism. Oh, I'm Christianism. <laughs> yeah, and famously, they're quite a loud group. Terrifying stuff, really. Because again, it just points to the number of people that are willingly living in a sort of parallel reality. Yes, and it may go without saying, but let's say it anyway. This figure is skewed towards Republicans and those who watch and trust extremely far-right news channels like One American News Network and Newsmax. Yeah, this is an important point to point out, is that it is, we're talking about extreme right-wing. Even Fox News, it only sort of, the number of people that believe in QAnon is like statistically insignificant to the people who are watching like CNN and stuff like that. It only really becomes significant when you're talking about Newsmax Mm -hmm. and One American News. Like it is that far flung. It's people who find Fox News too liberal. Yes, right. 
While now some Republicans have tried to distance themselves from QAnon, we're starting to see this trend reflected in the makeup of the US government itself. According to watchdog group Media Matters for America, at least 48 candidates running for Congress, Congress, quote, have previously endorsed or given credence to QAnon. Now, I would say, before we move on with this, is that I don't know how genuine all of these people are, right? Some of these people know that there is just a growing group within the US population that they can tap into. Let's get that QAnon, that QAnon vote, you know? And that human on pound, because when we come on, to, when you go in to look at who's making the most money, who's raising the most money, these Q and on Congress people. Oh yeah, I bet they're fucking raking it in. Because again, if you really believe there is a satanic cabal of paedophiles eating children, you're going to give a lot of money to a candidate who says they're going to stop it. So how genuine they're being, I don't know. I just find it so mind-boggling that there is literally one atheist in Congress because it is so like un-American uh-huh. to be not religious, but there's 48 alleged QAnoners running. Mm-hmm. If that doesn't show you that America might have got some stuff twisted over the years, that should be your evidence, I think. Again, I think that's the problem though, isn't it? Things like QAnon, they seem ridiculous, but they're only a sort of extrapolation of They're a religious. symptom, not the cause, yeah. yeah. And it's also like America is a much more religious country than, say, the UK is. So when you already have a population that is primed to believe things blindly, and by that I mean religious indoctrination as a child and as a teenager and as an adult, you've already sort of dampened their ability to think critically, makes them prime for things like QAnon taking off. This episode of Red Handed is sponsored by Novo. Fortune favours the bold, and the strong, and the brave. For your business to break out of anything holding you back, you need business checking as brave as you are. Enter Novo Business Checking. Novo is powerful, simple business checking. And unlike the traditional banking model, Novo has no minimum balances, no transaction limits, and no hidden fees. Instead of a one-size-fits-all approach, Novo is customized to your business to save you time and free up cash flow with seamless integrations to Stripe, Shopify, QuickBooks Online, and all your lovely favorites. Sign up for Novo for free and join the community of over 150,000 fearless small businesses who found the customizable business checking solution that admires their brave. Sign up for your free business checking account right now at novo.co slash redhanded. Plus, redhanded listeners get access to over $5,000 in perks and discounts. Make sure you go to novo.co slash redhanded to sign up all for free. Novo.co slash redhanded. Novo Platform Incorporated is a fintech, not a bank. Banking services provided by Middlesex Federal Savings FA member FDIC. Terms and conditions apply. This episode of Red Handed is sponsored by Get Upside. Attention, all spooky bitches. Get Upside is an incredible app everyone who buys gas needs to know about, or petrol, as we say, in jolly England. Our listeners are earning cash back for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or on Google Play right now. You can use promo code RED for $5 per gallon or more off on your first fill up. That's cash back. Get cash back using Get Upside. Just download the app for free and use promo code RED for $5 per gallon or more off on your first tank. And it's not just gas, it's not just petrol. You can earn up to 30% cash back at grocery stores, restaurants, and takeouts too. And you can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e gift card for Amazon and loads of other brands. All you need to do is download the absolutely free Get Upside app and use promo code RED, R-E-D to get $5 per gallon or more cash back off your first tank. Just use our promo code RED. So we don't know how genuine some of these Congress hopefuls are, but we do know that a few definitely have said some really fucked up shit, including that Satan worshippers hide among the Democratic Party, obviously. Prime example, Luis Miguel, a man running for the House of Representatives from Florida, obviously, tweeted in November 2021, America is a Christian nation. I will never stop fighting against the satanic globo-communists. Hashtag America first. Just throw communism in there while you're at it. But again, you know, we'll go on to talk about the link between the two. But I think it's, again, though, I would say, obviously, if somebody were a hyper-Christian or a hyper-some-other-religion, polite society would be like, oh, you know, 
you believe that Muhammad flew to the moon on a winged horse yeah. or you believe that Jesus literally rose from the dead and then pushed a rock away and then walked out or whatever. But you believe that there is a satanic cabal of pedophiles running the government a la Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. It's kind of like, this is a modern, I'm not saying it's great. Again, I'm not saying it's great. I'm not defending these people. We're going to talk about all of the very, very insidious stuff like anti-Semitism that is deeply rooted in these beliefs. But why is it that much more crazy? Is it because it didn't happen 2,000 years ago mm. and they're saying it's happening now? Some of it is happening now. Let's talk about the evolution of the satanic panic from the 70s and the 80s to today. I think this fits very well with that comment about satanic globo communists. I think that, and this isn't exactly a hot take, we've talked about this before on the show, I think that things like the satanic panic are obviously fueled by and reflective of what people are ultimately scared of in different eras. In the 70s, people were definitely scared of like the huge amount of change that they were experiencing, especially like socially and culturally. In the 80s, where we were last week, it was very much the era of stranger danger. And also people during those decades had just come out of the Cuban Missile Crisis, McCarthyism, so yelling communist to everybody. And they were also still living through the first Cold War. So the satanic panic of the 70s and 80s feels like a kind of pivoted version of McCarthyism. Rather than communists, people were now looking for literal demons. So what about the QAnon satanic panic of today? Well, this feels much more like a fear largely emanating from, like we've been talking about, those who have been left behind. Inequality is absolutely rampant today. And it's arguably the worst it's ever been. A single income household would have happily managed with two kids and a dog. Like imagine a family where it's yeah. like dad goes to work, mum stays at home, you've got two kids, a dog, you've got a house, everybody's very comfortable. But those days are long gone. Oh, and after COVID, obviously, inequality is only getting worse and only going to get worse. So it's no coincidence that the first time we saw anything like the Capitol riots was after four years of Trump. Because whatever you think of him, and I'm not here to defend him, he made a lot of people who had been ignored for generations by the political classes feel like they had a voice. And then you throw on top of that people telling you, you know, that the election had been rigged against him by the satanic cabal of pedophiles because he was going to stop them. Of course, you're going to go yeah. and riot. You think it's true. And also, we are in a world where we're more connected than ever. So we're also hearing news from other parts of the world constantly about elections being rigged. All of the stuff that the Democratic Party was pushing about how Russia had rigged the election, rigged the election, rigged the election. Then, of course, the other side was going to yell the same thing when Biden won. So no one's hands are clean here. No. There are Democrats who literally spent four years screaming that the election was rigged against them. Hillary Clinton. <laughs> so imagine someone who's living paycheck to paycheck and they hear about QAnon, start to engage with it. They would start to wonder why their lives are so hard compared to the rich and powerful that are being shoved down their throats all the time. They're wealthier, they're better looking, they're more successful. And you start to think maybe it isn't just expensive plastic surgery. Maybe the reason rich people look so much better than the rest of us is because of adrenochrome and deals with the devil. You can see it. I guess like if you are, say, a 50-year-old woman who's lived a very ordinary but very hard life, maybe, and you look at J-Lo and you're like, she's the same age as me. Yeah. It's got to be the devil's mm -hmm. work. Literally, yeah, I can understand how you wouldn't even be able to fathom or you couldn't even fathom that this must be something that is normal. It must be something ungodly. I can understand. And if you were this paycheck to paycheck, fledgling QAnoner, you might be thinking, why would God subject me to a life of such hardship? It can't be because he doesn't exist. It can't be because he's not actually as benevolent as we believe him to be. It must be because the devil is also at play here. And if he is he'll want the ultimate sacrifices from these elites who have lived such a glorious life. Yeah, he's not just going to be giving it away for nothing, is it? If J-Lo gets to look like that, she must be doing something pretty fucked up. Yeah, and I think in a lot of fundamentalist Christian situations, the belief universally is that the earth is in the devil's hands already. Oh, really? Oh, Interesting. yeah. And by being a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness or whatever, you are choosing the light. Because the earth is in the hands of the devil. Oh, I see. And so our pay to pay check QAnon Ling, our Q-Ling, wouldn't want to make a deal with the devil because they're a good Christian person. And also because if they did make a deal with the devil to look better and be richer, that would mean they would have to rape, torture and murder children. So forget the old boys club. 
It's the devil's gang, and everyone who is rich and successful is in on it. So for some who maybe aren't obviously quote-unquote left behind or struggling with income inequality, why would they get involved with something like QAnon? Well, obviously, there are other reasons for why people may feel left behind. There's definitely a lot of mental illness at play in these situations and other types of disenfranchisement or sort of social lack of status, Mm -hmm. let's say. And I think this status thing is what really sort of cinches it, because in his book, The Status Game, Will Stork, who is a journalist, talks about how people compete for status in the modern world in three ways. Competence, dominance and virtue. And for those who perhaps can't compete on dominance, and here we're talking about the paycheck to paycheck QAnon app, but also maybe people who aren't economically in that situation but still believe in QAnon, if they can't compete on competence and also feel powerless and therefore dominance is out of the window, well then virtue becomes the only answer. And it's exactly like you just said, Hannah. They will be looking at these people who are leading such successful lives and be like, why don't I have that? Oh, I don't have it because I'm a good person and I wouldn't collude with the devil and do all of this horrible stuff. That's why I don't have it. So the only way to change this is to bring down the devil Mm -hmm. and bring down these people who are happy to suck on the fucking necks of kids and look as young as they do. And Diane Benscotter, who's a cult expert and founder of an organization called Antidote, which is basically a cult deprogramming group. They Mm -hmm. help people get out of QAnon and stuff. Said, quote, that it makes people feel better about themselves, this idea of belonging to a group or a movement like QAnon. They feel a sense of self-righteousness. They feel like they have comrades fighting this good fight, and they have an enemy that they can now blame for whatever's going on in their life that maybe they're not happy about. But it also requires an all-or-nothing commitment. So you can't just be like, well, I kind of believe these things, and that's why I'm not really happy. you got to go whole hog. And they do. And all of us watched in horror as this community leapt off the pages of the internet and into the very real world into a mob storming the Capitol building in 2021. Many of these people truly, in their heart of hearts, believed because they had been told that the election had been stolen from Trump. For them, it was the only explanation for how he could have lost. After all, he was doing the Lord's work. So it must have been a conspiracy to get him out of office by the satanic paedophiles because they don't want him there because his job as the crown prince of QAnon is to get rid of them and expose them. And if I really believed that, I'd be pretty pissed off too. Absolutely. I don't know if I'd be furry hat pissed off, but, you know, I could get there. You could get there. If you had spent 24-7 consuming that information, I think you could have got there. Now, we're not going to go much more in detail into the Capitol riots themselves, but if you want to know more about it, there is a really good podcast that I can recommend called The Coming Storm by BBC World Service, and it's well worth listening to if you want a take on the Capitol riots one year on. In this podcast, Gabriel Gatehouse, who is the international editor of BBC's Newsnight, goes in search of the origins of the satanic cabal theory and finds that it seems to have all started back in 1993 with the suicide of a White House aide named Vince Foster. Vince died during Bill Clinton's presidency, and almost immediately, sort of these accusations started flying around that the Clintons had killed him, and that they were some sort of murderous and corrupt couple, desperate for more and more power. And with this, the Clinton body count began. And in 2016, many of you may remember the bizarre accusations made against John Podesta, the former White House chief of staff, and then Hillary Clinton campaign chair. A series of his emails were leaked. One of these emails was an exchange between his brother, who's called Tony, and performance artist Marina Abramovich. This email read, Dear Tony, I'm so looking forward to the spirit cooking dinner at my place. Do you think you'll be able to let me know if your brother is joining? All my love, Marina. And I think you can probably predict how this went down. This sent QAnoners and the far right into an absolute nuclear meltdown, with Alex Jones running headfirst into the crazy. According to Infowars, spirit cooking refers to, quote, a sacrament in the religion of Thelema, which was founded by alleged Satanist Alistair Crowley. No, it wasn't. I am particularly au fait with Alistair Crowley. Nope. All he did was write poems about gonorrhea. Like, there's no, like... And rip off Anne Rind. <laughs> exactly. It's not... Sorry. No, that, unfortunately, info wars. <laughs> that is just not true. But even WikiLeaks, which I was really disappointed by, tweeted, The Podesta's spirit cooking dinner, question mark. It's not what you think. 
It's blood, sperm and breast milk, but mostly blood. Obviously, maybe not so obviously, I don't know anymore. Who am I? Who's the president? What year is it? We are not convinced that spirit cooking is blood and semen and breast milk. We are reasonably convinced that spirit cooking is actually a reference to the name of a series of etchings that Abramovich debuted in the mid-90s. You can look up the performance art. Yeah, she's using blood or what looks like blood. But if you look at this email through the lens of confirmation bias, it will obviously look a lot more like a satanic ritual than a bit of 90s drama art. I had a look at Marina's work. Mm -hmm. It's very 90s. So 90s. It's very like, you know what it reminds me of? It's like when Shia LaBeouf just sat in a room with a bag on his head. Like it's that. But 90s. Yeah, more bloody. But more bloody, like quite Tracy Mm MN. You know, Mm -hmm. like it's, everyone was fucking at it. It was shock value Mm -hmm. 90s performance art. Precisely. Precisely. And everybody went fucking nuts for it when this email came out. Well, as an artist, Mm -hmm. that's what you want. I mean, yes. Though there were some like weird repercussions from this. Like there was a lot of like hacking that happened to Marina and stuff like this because people like really believed it. It was nuts. It was nuts. And like WikiLeaks doing that. I don't think that WikiLeaks really thought it. I just thought they, they're they being trolls here. Yeah, they they're love that like, too. They yeah. are. They're just like, let's, let's signal boost this bullshit. So reality really does feel like it's sort of become split down the middle. I think when people were watching the whole Trump Hillary thing play out, I think a lot of people were either seeing Trump as this absolute villain or as Hillary as an absolute villain. There was like no middle ground for people. People weren't looking at the nuance of the situation. But that's what happens when people are poor and disenfranchised Mm -hmm. and unhappy. It happens all over the world in every single country. It absolutely does. But I would also argue that in this case, and in many cases, that the other side was doing exactly the oh, same yes, thing. Oh, no, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think it's the black or white thinking part Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. And also, we have seen not just this hyperpolarization, hyperpartisanship, we've also seen the rise of negative partisanship, which I hadn't come across as a term before. But what it means is essentially you look at your political opponents. So anybody who sits on the other side of the political framework to you, You don't look at them as somebody who just has different opinions and different views. And you don't even look at them as somebody who maybe wants the same end goal as you, but has a different opinion on how to get there. And you can have like a good faith conversation with them about why a certain type of monetary policy wouldn't work or why welfare is a good idea or something. You look at them as being evil. You look at them as being fundamentally evil and corrupt and wanting the total opposite from you. And I think it's such a shame that that's where we, because I don't even think it's, I think that rhetoric is so pervasive Mm -hmm. today. It's like if you politically disagree with someone or disagree with someone on anything, Mm -hmm. they hate you for it. Like, how did we get here? I think like we could all benefit from Mm -hmm. becoming a little bit more comfortable with disagreement. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? Because I have definitely been this way in my 20s, I would say. But definitely when things like COVID happened and people had very like hyper-partisan views about that, it really did make me rethink a lot of the ways that I had been thinking. So speaking to some of my friends who had more right-wing views, and I was like, oh my God. And then I listened to them. I was like, we want the same thing. You're not evil. You're not like a sick person who wants people to suffer. You just have a different idea of how we get there than I do. I think your political views and stuff should constantly be changing. If it's not, it's probably because you're stagnating. But I think this negative partisanship idea really feeds the QAnon war machine. Because it feeds that idea that somebody on the opposite political spectrum to you is not just wrong or not just thinking about things differently through the lens of their own experience. They are evil. And then it's a short fucking hop, skip and a jump to calling them a satanic paedophile. So you'll also be massively unsurprised to hear that those people who believe in QAnon are much, 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 much more likely to also believe in other wild conspiracy theories. And we've done a deep dive before into why people believe in conspiracy theories. We're not going to do it again here because, like I said, we've done it before. And if you miss that, go back and check out our episode on Max Spires. But essentially, today, what we need to understand is that people like to feel like they have some kind of special knowledge that other people, ordinary people, don't. Look at fucking solicitors and accountants. Classic fucking example. This is my theory, right? And I'm going to get dragged for this, but I don't care because I feel very strongly. And also, if you disagree with me, that's fine. We'll just agree to disagree. Solicitors and accountants aren't smart. They just go to university to learn a secret language. And they don't tell anyone else that secret language. And that's how they pretend to be important. There you go. Hannah's hot takes. takes. It's the same thing. 
But unlike accountants and lawyers who are famously unemotional, actually emotionless robots, these beliefs for QAnon people are based on emotion. Their beliefs are based not on evidence or facts, but in spite of evidence and facts. So conspiracy theories like QAnon can't be battled with facts or even reason. Actually, evidence against these conspiracy theories can itself become evidence of the claim's validity in the minds of the believers. You cannot win. It's like, uh, you know... the It's the logical black hole again. Yes. So, the harder you try to disprove a conspiracy theory, the more you actually just reinforce it, because it's a big cover-up. Yeah, especially with these ones, right? How are you going to sit across it from a QAnon and then be like, there is a deep state of satanic paedophiles running the world, or trying to run the world? And you'd be like, no, there isn't. And they'll be like, well, explain Jeffrey Epstein. Look at what he did. Facts, facts, facts. How are you going to argue your way out of that? I can't logically argue my way out of that. Because how am I going to disprove the things that they're saying? Mm -hmm. This sort of logical black hole is particularly true, particularly present when there's a lot of confusion, pain, chaos and or hype around an event or a situation like 9-11, the mood landing, Sandy Hook. And this brings us back to our inequality argument, because we'd absolutely argue that the biggest challenge facing us today, right now, this very moment, is inequality and poverty. And the ramifications of that inequality and poverty are that there now exists an ever-growing group of people so disenfranchised that they choose to live in another world altogether. And on the flip side, you have an ever-growing group of people who feel like so smug about their lives, looking down on these people, feeling like they're stupid. And you're seeing that ultra polarization. And while these conspiracy theories of satanic cannibals running the world seems terrifying, they oddly and ironically give the people who believe in them a sense of order. And if you're brought up to believe that God can do good for you, then again, why would it be so weird to believe that the devil is real and doing bad things? It just seems like if you can be taught to believe one, I don't see that it's a far leap to believe it's this It's not, other. it's two sides of the same coin. And I think like also people will be like, oh, well, you know, these people are awful, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we're going to go on to talk about how awful some of them are. But I think it's also a massive indictment of like the failures of our education system. So yeah, things are bad. And when bad things are happening, what do we know happens? That's right. Racism and scapegoating. And this movement, QAnon, is no different. QAnon is absolutely brimming with ugly and old school anti-Semitism. Jacob Rothschild and George Soros are often key figures of hate among this group. And it doesn't stop there. Because the whole drinking of children's blood thing, well, that's about as old school anti-Semitic as it gets. Blood libel, which is the slur levied against Jews that they just love to torture Christians, especially Christian children, and use their blood in their Passover rituals, which then, of course, became a justification for atrocious crimes against Jews in the Middle Ages and far, far, far beyond. This accusation seems to have kicked off in medieval England, where nothing bad ever happened. <laughs> and it started with the murder of a young boy named William of Norfolk, way back. In 1144. That's way back. That's before the English even invaded Ireland for the first time. <laughs> it's that far back. So the murder of William of Norfolk didn't really gain too much traction at the time of his death, presumably because everyone was too busy dying at 30. But the poor boy's death would soon be connected to history's favourite pastime, blaming the Jews. A monk named Thomas of Monmouth wrote that as the Jews began to celebrate Passover in Norwich in 1144, they had abducted William and tortured him. Apparently, they then shaved his head and stabbed at him with thorns. Then, they tied his feet up with chains and pierced the left side of his body. Sunday school graduates will know where this is going. And this idea still sits at the very heart of the blood libel conspiracy theory that Jews are obsessed with reenacting the torture and killing of Jesus Christ. Specifically on Christian kids. Yes. Because the whole Jews killed Jesus argument, it comes from Pontius Pilate, right? And he's in front of this crowd in Jerusalem and he thinks that Jesus should be let go. And then the crowd vote whether Barabbas dies or whether Jesus dies. And Pontius Pilate says, I wash my hands of this. So that's where it comes from of Jews killed Jesus mm -hmm. is the people in the crowd voted Jesus's death over Barabbas, right? That's 
where it comes from. Mm-hmm. What? How fucking ridiculous! Like, and also they were Romans. Like, jo- I mean, also, like it's not, and it uh, never happened. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. And also two points there, which is one is this idea of the original sin idea from Christianity, right? This idea that if those Jews did it back then, thousands and thousands of years ago, everybody who is Jewish now, still today, is culpable of that crime. Like, what the fuck? This um, idea of collective guilt is so, so, so fucking dangerous. And I think that, again, people like sort of shun it when they don't like it, obviously when we're talking about things like racism, but they fucking love it in other contexts. This is why I hate the whole like, all white people are racist nonsense. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's nonsense. It's nonsense. And I think collective guilt is some fucking bullshit. Stop saying it because tell me how that's okay and this isn't okay. Mm -hmm. Like it's all nonsense. Let's not do that, please. So let's get back to William. Just like the Pontius Pilate washing his hands of the death of the King of the Jews, it's quite difficult to prove any of the injuries that William sustained, since Monmouth, the monk that wrote about it, claimed all of those things quite a few years after William's murder. But that didn't stop the monks moving William's body into their monk cemetery. And Monmouth started to report that William's body still smelt fresh even after all that time, and apparently a rose bush on his grave kept its flowers all year round. I think Mr. Monmouth is uh, hungry for canonization, is what oh, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy Monmouth, he is fucking obsessed with starting the cult of the William of Norwich. Right. That is what he wants. He wants, like, this kid to be what? Like, made into a saint so that he can be the one who told the story of this saint. So maybe he gets something in return for that. Like, he is mad for it. He spends his entire life basically harping on about this and at the same time creating this vicious anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that still exists today. This was in 1144, just to remind everybody. It's madness. So despite Monmouth's best efforts, the blood libel story actually only kicked into the mainstream years later at another murder trial. To understand this one, and I know, guys, we're dragging you all over the fucking shop in terms of, like, historical timelines, but just bear with me. To understand this murder trial, we need to look at the Crusades. Not the first Crusade, because that was actually pretty successful for the Christians. They got Jerusalem back. They had a good time. Richard the Lionheart. Yeah, they took a lot of spoils. The second Crusade, 50 years later, which presumably was like, hey, that worked out really well for us. Maybe we try it again. This one, however, was a bit of a shit show. They had absolutely no spoils to enjoy, and these crusades only left the people who got involved with them in an absolute ton of debt. And much of this debt was to the church, but some of it was to moneylenders. One man, named Simon de Novas, owed quite a bit of money to a Jewish man who was his moneylender. So in 1149, five years after William of Norwich's death, Simon de Novas decided the best way to handle this was to just kill the man he owed that money to. And because violence against Jews was sadly becoming pretty commonplace at this point, I think De Novas thought that he'd just get away with it. And he did. But what's interesting is his defence in court. Because this is what set the blood libel story on its unstoppable path, one that we are still seeing today. De Novas was defended by Bishop Turb, who argued that the Jewish man that De Novas had killed was actually the one who had killed William five years ago. Good. Yeah, there's about 10 people in England at this time. (laughs) Yeah, they're like, he did it. And Turb didn't specifically point the finger at anyone else, even though the accusation from Monmouth was always that a group of Jews had done this. He doesn't point the finger at anybody else, except the murdered man. But he made it clear that even though he wasn't going to point the finger at anybody else because he had absolutely no fucking evidence, all the Jews of the world were guilty of this crime. So, yeah collective guilt. She's tapping her temple as she's saying that. Don't do it. (laughs) After that, William's remains were once again dug up and moved to the local cathedral. We don't know how fresh they were smelling at that particular moment in time. (laughs) Poor William. He gets buried in the forest, dug up, moved to the monk cemetery, then dug up again and moved to the... Just leave him alone. And then, seeing the wonders that this had worked for De Novas, William's story was used repeatedly at trials of other people who had killed Jews. And when people in other places found out about all of this, thanks to Monmouth and his book, The Life and Miracles of St. William of Norwich. Which you can still get as a fucking Penguin classic or something. Shut up. I promise you. Oh my God. I know. So 
obviously the Monmouth monk is, you know, he's making mad stacks with this book. So everyone's like, oh, that must be completely fine. He's a man of God. And they started to make the same accusations of Jews in their local area. Yeah, because they can't keep blaming this, like, William of Norwich. No. Like, oh, he killed him as well, even though he lives in France. So they just start saying it everywhere, that the Jews that they knew had done it to some other kid. And the French are at it too. French King Philip II tested the waters by charging some Jews with the murder of a 12-year-old boy from Pontois. And by 1182, this ludicrous accusation was widespread and powerful enough that the king kicked out all of the Jews from France and took all of their money and their property and their belongings. Handy, isn't it? We should be like, you all did it. Every single one of you. And we're taking your money and your property. Because we're in all of this debt because we accidentally went to Jerusalem again and lost. Yeah. And a century later, back in jolly old England, in Lincoln specifically, when the body of a young boy was found in a well, 18 local Jews were hanged. In the Italian town of Trent, when a two-year-old was killed, the Jewish community was tortured until they confessed to things like having used the boy's blood to make matzo balls. They were then burned at the stake. Like, this is just, it's all so unbelievably fucking crazy. Obviously, we all know that this happened. But just skipping ahead a few centuries, because this doesn't go away, it just gains traction, if anything, because people keep seeing how it works. So yeah, skipping ahead a few centuries, during the Spanish Inquisition, Jews were again accused of the Passion of Christ-themed torture sessions that they were apparently running on all the local Christian kids. In the mid-19th century, the Jews of Damascus were charged with the death of a Christian monk that they supposedly killed and used his blood in their religious rites. And this happened in the mid-19th century, right? Or allegedly happened in the mid-19th century. Apparently what happened is that monk just disappeared. Like, that's all they have. But in 1983, Mustafa tells the then Syrian defence minister wrote a book in which he included this alleged ritual murder in Damascus in the fucking intro of his book as if it was a fact. And in 2014, 2014, a Hamas spokesman told a Lebanese television channel, quote, We all remember how the Jews used to slaughter Christians in order to mix their blood in their holy matzos. This is not a figment of imagination or something taken from a film. It is a fact acknowledged by their own books and by historical evidence. Ooh. Yep. And when he was asked for evidence to back up his claims, the man surprisingly couldn't do it. There's no such thing as one size fits all. It never works. Whether it's clothes, skincare, or even eating at a restaurant, we don't all want or need the same thing. And this is even more true when it comes to hair care. Everyone's hair is different. I've personally had my hair struggles, you guys all know, and I'm sure you've had them too. But thanks to my personalised hair care routine from Pros, I can honestly say that I've never been more in love with my hair. The reason Pros works for me is because it was designed for me. I took their in-depth consultation where Pros asked me some questions to work out what was right for my hair. They even asked if I went swimming often or if I lived in an area with high pollution or to see what could be taking its toll on my hair. Then they analysed my answers and found the unique blend of ingredients that needed to be in every product of my custom hair care routine. Personally, I noticed a huge difference when I started using the shampoo that they sent me. They made sure it was packed with antioxidant-rich sunflower oil to suit my hair perfectly. And the difference is magical. And if that wasn't enough, everything Pro sent out is cruelty-free, responsibly sourced and ethically gathered. So you can have guilt-free, gorgeous hair. Plus, if you're not 100% positive, Pros is what's best for you. They'll take their products back, no questions asked. Pros is the healthy hair regime with your name all over it. So take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Just go to pros.com slash redhanded. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash redhanded for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. How many people do you know that have used some sketchy whitening product they bought off the internet that you couldn't believe made it through customs? Don't get me wrong. I want those pearly whites, but I'm not going to put actual bleach in my mouth to get them. And that's why I use Lumino. Lumino make all the dental care essentials like toothpaste, mouthwash and whitening products using natural ingredients that help your smile rather than harming it. With Lumino, you won't find any harsh bleaches, artificial dyes or alcohol in any of their products. Everything they make is dentist formulated and backed by over 50 studies. Rather than filling your mouth with actual bleach, 
Lumino uses uncompromising ingredients like sea salt, aloe, and coconut oil to give you amazing results without the harm to your smile. I've personally found Lumino whitening strips are fantastic. They're super effective and perfect for sensitive teeth like mine. Plus, they only take 30 minutes to apply and you start seeing results in just seven days. I have to say though that my favorite thing about Lumino is that I'm not worried about what I'm doing to my smile to get these amazing results. I love how my smile feels and looks, and I know you'll love Lumino as much as I do too. So to get 15% off your order today, just go to getlumino.com slash redhanded and use code redhanded. Now pay attention to the spelling because that's G-E-T-L-U-M-I-N-E-U-X dot com slash redhanded and use code redhanded to say 15%. That's getlumino.com slash redhanded. So it's hard to ignore the glaring similarities to the QAnon blood drinking and adenochrome theories. And on top of all of the gross anti-Semitism in QAnon, we're now starting to see real-life violence spill over from the internet forums. In 2019, the FBI identified QAnon as a domestic terrorist threat, which is a fact. And, you know, it sounds poor taste perhaps, but we've actually wanted to cover QAnon for ages but we had to wait until there was an outright action of murder connected with it. We didn't wish for it, but we did sort of know that it was only a matter of time. In August 2020, a woman in Denver, along with the help of a group of QAnon followers, tried to kidnap her son from a foster care facility because she believed he was going to be abused and killed. The same month, in Texas, another woman rammed her car into another vehicle, claiming that she was saving children from being trafficked and that Trump was, quote, literally taking down the cabal and the paedophile ring. Weirder still, in 2019, 24-year-old Anthony Camello killed Francesco Frankie Boy Cali, a leader in the Gambino crime family. He lured him outside of his home, and then Anthony pulled a gun from his car and shot Frankie Boy dead. In court, he claimed that he was trying to help Trump and stop the deep state by killing the mobster. And to be honest, this list goes on and on and on. But the next case we're going to tell you about is easily the worst we've seen. On the 7th of August 2021, a woman named Abby Coleman in Santa Barbara, California called 911. She was worried that her husband had abruptly taken their two children, two-year-old Kaleo and 10-month-old Roxy, and disappeared. He wasn't responding to any of her messages anymore, and his Find My iPhone app showed that he was in Rosarito, Mexico, 250 miles away from where they lived. He hadn't even taken a car seat with him. The police actually called in the FBI because it all looked so weird, even though Abby kept saying that the pair hadn't argued and that she didn't think her husband would hurt the kids. Two days later, on Monday the 9th of August, 40-year-old Matthew Taylor Coleman was found and detained when he tried to cross the border back into the US. When the FBI searched his vehicle, the children weren't with him, but their blood was in his van. Within hours, Coleman had confessed to having murdered both of his children, and he gave the police the locations of their bodies and the murder weapon. Kaleo and Roxy's bodies were discovered on a remote ranch in Rosarito under a willow tree covered in blood and wearing only nappies. They had both been stabbed multiple times with a spear-fishing gun. Coleman, who has a job title that uh, is quite something, was an evangelical surf instructor, and he claimed that Q was actually talking to him and he really believed that Donald Trump was secretly battling a satanic cabal of paedophiles in the upper echelons of the government. To those who knew Coleman, it was all completely unbelievable. He'd been a totally normal, happily married guy. He ran a surf company, and him and his wife Abby had been together for ages. Until a year before the murders, Coleman had been a devout Christian. But these beliefs had actually quickly become displaced and replaced with an obsession with QAnon. He even started to believe that the church and church leaders were a part of the conspiracy. Again, paedophilic church leaders, sure. Then his paranoia started to spread to his friends and family, even his wife Abby. Then in the week leading up to the killings, Coleman had started to talk about hand gestures of evil that he was seeing on social media. And these hand gestures of evil that Coleman is talking about is basically when he sees people do the peace sign. Ah. Yeah. He publicly began accusing people of being in on it. Coleman's deterioration seems to have happened incredibly fast. That's why people were so surprised. He seemed normal one day and very, very quickly he deteriorates. And Coleman told the FBI 
that he had been, quote, enlightened by QAnon and that he had been receiving visions and signs telling him that his wife Abby had passed her own serpent DNA onto his children. He claimed that he knew what he had done was wrong when he had killed them, but that he had had to because he was afraid they would, quote, grow into monsters. Coleman has since pleaded not guilty to two counts of foreign first-degree murder, so there will be a trial. And the issue in court will be, was Coleman insane or was he totally in control and just believed QAnon so much that he killed for it? I think it does seem like a not guilty by reason of an insanity case. It feels very Andrea Yates. It does. I think if they can prove that he was insane at the time, and while you can be insane, know that there is a difference between right and wrong in terms of like the laws of this planet, but you think there is a high and noble purpose for which you're operating, it's still not guilty by reason of insanity. But is he just saying that because it's the whole virtue card Mm -hmm. and he's saying, I know it was wrong, but like he still, I don't know. It's very complicated and I wouldn't like to be the prosecutor or the defender on this. No, so we'll have to wait and see what happens. But of course, QAnoners have been quick to take to the interwebs and dismiss the entire horrific incident by claiming that it's a false flag operation to discredit them because you can say that for everything. Absolutely. And for an organisation so gung-ho about saving the kiddies from all of the Satan paedophiles, Seems pretty odd that they would just write off the death of these two children. But then again, what measure of normalcy makes any sense this week? I think with basically all of these cases, there is absolutely an element of mental illness involved. And that isn't to demonise people with mental health issues. But I think a woman who spoke to Vice in 2019 described it really, really accurately when she was talking about how her mum, who deals with a lot of mental health issues herself, has been sucked into the world of QAnon. And this is what she said, quote, She had a hard time anyway, dealing with the real world, and now the world is so much worse for her because of all the horrible things the cult deals with. Devil worship, sex trafficking, children being tortured and eaten, or used as sex slaves. You can see how somebody already dealing with a lot of issues, emotionally or mentally, that's going to create another tipping point. Absolutely. And like we've talked about before, including last week, when people have delusions, their delusions are shaped on the information that they have been exposed to on a daily basis. So extremely religious people tend to suffer from religiously themed delusions. And so it only stands to reason that if you really believe that the world is filled with satanic paedophiles, it could cause a mental break and then also go on to shape that very psychosis. So what now? What's next? What's coming up? Unfortunately, nothing good. The satanic panic of the 70s and 80s ran absolutely rabid and was fueled by religion. It went on for decades. But QAnon has become a religion in and of itself. As we saw with Coleman, he actually turned his back on the church the more QAnon took over. And also, QAnon has real political power. Whether the politicians involved are true believers or not, or just exploiting the movement, doesn't really matter, the effects are the same. And despite the bans and all of the incorrect predictions Q made, don't think QAnon's going anywhere, especially as we're now seeing it tip over into Europe. And when it's sort of founded on, on nothingness, it can go on forever, can't it? Yeah. And again, it's that coming back to that open source nature of it and the builder and adventure nature of it, where people can interpret it however they want, add whatever they want to it. And it's just going to keep getting worse and worse. Yeah. And I think that this isn't going anywhere. It's only going to get worse, especially as we see the rising cost of living, hyperinflation, and inevitably, absolutely, inequality getting worse and worse. And on that happy note, (laughs) we will leave you this week. I think the key takeaway from this is to laugh at stuff like this Mm. is to, I'm not saying invalidate in a way that it's, because obviously, you know, I don't believe it's true. But the people who really do believe it's true, believe it's true because they're not being served by the current system. Yeah. And I think that it is comical. I'm not saying it's Oh, yeah, absolutely. It is hilarious in the things that they are believing. Of course it is, just in the same way that we find religion the same way. But I think that, again, it comes back to that, what you do or how you react to this depends on what you want. And if you want people to come back into the fold, come out of the fringes of this way of thinking, then you can't reach them with denigration or with facts and reason. You have to reach people through emotion. And to do that, you have to understand why Mm -hmm. they think the way they think. So that is that, guys. That is the end of our two-part on the evolution of the satanic panic, all the way from the 70s to today. Hopefully you enjoyed it. It was a bit of a different one, but we really enjoyed putting it together for you. And next week, we'll be back with a much more classic, (laughs) shall we say, true crime case. 
If you would like a palate cleanser, come hang out with us on Under the Duvet immediately after this. If you don't know what Under the Duvet is, it is, of course, the official after party here at Red Handed exclusively Mm -hmm. on Patreon. And I finally have an empty handed update because I'm back on the scene. Oh, yeah. And it's a, it's a, it went badly. It went badly. So if you want to hear about it, you're going to have to pay for it. Come and come and over to Patreon. And if you don't know what empty handed updates are, they are dating updates from the world of Hannah and Saruti. Yeah. So come check that out. Um, we also have a ton of extra content over on Patreon. In the month of February, because it was, of course, the month of love, we did an entire bonus episode on hyperstophilia where we looked at the likes of Doreen Leoy and, of course, the Night Stalker and Carla Hamolka and Paul Bernardo. So come check that out. We'll see you probably next time. Goodbye. Bye.